Hello, my name is Mr. Lewis. I am proud to specialize in the University of Minnesota. Introduce our company, GEC Creative. We are a partner with the Minnesota Department of Human Services to bring you a weapon machine and tell you to make it work a part of your play. Please visit your team of several webinars and we'll give a variety of topics including employment, temperature, support, and policy to be Today, Today's webinar is titled Using Language of you use the language of real rich expectations. Work can be a powerful tool to influence how we think and behave. How we think and behave. A few years ago, I was on an, I was on an airplane. They took me next to me. Where do you work? Rather than do you, do you work? I know that a profound thing right there. That they work. Do you work? Are you both? Do you work? Do you work? Make them big difference. Make a webinar will challenge us to think out how about how we communicate about employment. And our work can have a powerful influence on making expectations. For having me here today. My name is Ann Rail, and I'm here to talk a little bit about person centered practices and the importance of our language, specifically in the area of employment. So, today we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the principles and the values of person centeredness. What is the difference between person centered thinking and person centered planning? And really, how we can uh, better understand raising expectations for the people that we're supporting and the people that we care about. So what I want to start with is just to think a little bit about what is it that we all think of when we hear the term person-centeredness or person-centered practices? Because we've been talking about this stuff for 20, 30 years. What does it mean to you as you're listening to this webinar? What comes to your mind? What are some of the words or uh, what do you see when you think of person-centered practices? What do you expect to see and hear from other people? What do you expect to see and hear from yourself? So for the most part when I ask people that question, what they tell me is they expect to be heard, have the experience of being listened to, um, but no one ever mentions paperwork. No one ever says, when I think of person-centered practices, I think of really great, beautiful forms. Because ultimately, person-centered practices are about how we treat each other, not at all about paper. And our paper can certainly have language that reflects how we treat each other, but person-centered practices are really about who we're being with one another and who we're being in the system, not about what we're doing. So the flip side of that question that's often useful to think about a little bit is what do we think about also when we think what isn't person-centered? What specific actions do you expect to not see in a system that's being person-centered? So another way to think about it is um, my uh, colleague and mentor Angela Amato often says the things that are not person-centered are the things that when we see them we say ah it shouldn't be happening that way it shouldn't be that way that practice shouldn't be that way it just doesn't even make sense often person-centered practices are just what naturally makes sense to us 
what we really want for people. And it's very easy to see and to experience when something's truly not person-centered. So how do we really want things to be? Everyone in this field ultimately has the, everyone in this field, everyone in this field ultimately has uh, the same commitment that we're listening to people and we're helping them have the kind of lives that they want to have. But how do we go about making sure that person-centered practices, those things we see that just make sense, are what's happening? And how do we ensure that those things that we see that frustrate us are not happening and that are not pulled for in our systems? Said another way, how do we begin to really raise our expectations of ourselves, of the people that work in our system, and how do we raise um, our expectations of the system itself. So one answer to that question is by thinking in more person-centered ways. So I want to talk a little bit about the difference between person-centered planning and person-centered thinking and why this idea of person-centered thinking is so important to us right now where we're at in our system and why it's so important in the search for meaningful employment. So for, for one, it's a way that we can be speaking a common and standard language about what it is we're committed to and about what it is we're doing. Person-centered thinking helps us to have natural, to naturally create actions and outcomes that are consistent with what really matters to people and that get us to helping people achieve what really matters to them. And the unique thing about person-centered thinking distinct from other specific person-centered planning methods is that it also helps us to make the system better. It helps us to build systems and forms and processes that make more sense for people. And so person-centered thinking is a bit different than person-centered planning. And we'll get into a little bit more of that later. But I think it's useful to start by identifying what are the myths about person-centered practices and then what are the key foundational core principles that tie all of those different practices together. So let's start with the myths. So the first myth we say, we say is uh, the myth that we're already doing it. So often um, because we're well-meaning, because we're committed professionals um, that care about people, we think, well, we must already be doing this. And that's one of the myths of person-centered practices because it is an ongoing practice um, that we should always be striving for. Uh, the second myth I wanna, I wanna underline is that person-centered practices many people often believe is just simply asking well, what do you want in life and then getting somebody everything they ask for which is ultimately not what person-centered practices are at all that's not what life is at all for any of us I don't think um, the fourth myth is that a good plan means a good life and if you've been around for long enough you've seen many good plans written that didn't lead to real change for people so a good plan doesn't mean a good life action toward inside of that plan and towards achieving that plan is what really makes the difference for people. Um, a few more myths that are, are worth uh, pointing to. The first is that person-centered practices only apply to people who receive services or only apply to one type of disability. So person-centered practices, it's critical that we see them as and operate and utilize person-centered practices, not just with people who receive services, but also with ourselves as professionals, with uh, our relationships with our colleagues, um, with our relationships um, with parents. Uh, I myself am a professional, have been for some time worked in the system, but I also have an eight-year-old son with a developmental disability. He has a diagnosis of autism. And how, who I am as a parent and how people interact with me as a parent needs to be person-centered for my son to have the best outcomes. And I, in turn, need to be interacting with those who support us in person-centered ways. And so um, that myth is that we're applying this to the people we're supporting or that I'm applying this to my son when in reality person-centered practices are how we should be relating to one another to really make the difference that we're committed to. So, and then finally, person-centered practices can only be done 
jointly, not just to make a difference for the person, but also to create organizational change and changes in the system. Because there are things in our organizations that just don't make sense and that get in the way of providing person-centered practices. And there are things in our system that also just don't make sense and get in the way. So person-centered processes all incorporate an element of changing our organizations, changing our systems, and ultimately changing our community to be more welcoming uh, to everyone. So after having looked at the myths, what are the foundational beliefs or what are the core, um, the core ideas and principles that string and pull all person-centered practices together? So the first is that the essential questions are, who is the person and what really matters to the person? So um, that's a very different question than what does a person want. It's a very different inquiry um, and it's not there's no black and white answer we arrive to. It really is something that evolves over the course of someone's life. The second foundational belief, again, we would find this in any person-centered practice, is that person-centeredness aims to change common patterns of community life. Again, as we talked about when we looked at the myths, this is not just about um, providing something in some way to make a difference only for that individual. It's also about how can we provide uh, services, supports, and information that stimulates community hospitality and makes the community a more wel welcoming place for everyone. So um, all person-centered practices also fundamentally challenge our um, set ways of being and acting that keep us distant from others. So um, one of the ways we talk about it in person-centered thinking is um, we often have set systems and patterns that create a power over relationship where we as professionals have power over the individuals we're supporting. So we really want to challenge those beliefs that keep us in controlling roles um, and um, keep the people we support separate from all of the rest of us. Um, found another foundational belief is uh, that our person-centered work must be grounded in the respect and dignity that we have and hold for all people and that each person has unique gifts and skills um, to contribute to our communities. So our job is to discover those so that they can be contributed. And finally, uh, a foundational belief is helping people to, to um, define and pursue their dreams, implementing person-centered practices with people. It's not simple and each person-centered practice will honor um, the fact that this isn't simple and it will honor the fact that as professionals um, doing this work will test our uh, resilience, it'll test our clarity, it'll test our commitment um, and our courage because it requires us to take uh, new actions for people that haven't been taken before. So those are the key foundational beliefs. So said another way, it's important to understand that much of our work focuses on this idea of community inclusion and um, we've done a lot of work to get people lives and jobs and homes in the community and there's a big difference between being present in the community and having what we're calling a true community life, a real community job, a real home in the community is very distinct from being present in the community. So we need to start to think and speak in different ways, not just about where people are, but what's available to them where they are. So let's talk a little bit more about that. Unfortunately, in our system, we've really built boundaries. We've built a service system. In this diagram, you can look at the, uh, you can see the triangle as the actual service system. And we have this, these systems of very critical and important services and supports in which people receive those services and supports. But the way we've built this system creates like a critical boundary, like the river that divides Minneapolis and St. Paul. It's a critical boundary between the people that we support and the rest of the community. And we want to change our ways of thinking so that while those services and supports in this diagram still exist and are still critical and important, they're provided in a way that supports people wherever they are in their chosen communities. And it's a very different way to structure our supports and services. And we need to, to think in, in different ways to have um, this diagram be 
the way that it quote unquote is for the people that we support. So we all actually want this. The struggle we're experiencing is how do we get from here to there. So we all want a system, simply put, where the people who use services, they are able to say what they want and how they want to live their life often with the support of their friends and family. They're able to use their public resources to get closer to that ideal or that vision of what they want. And finally, they're able to get the support that they need to make those first two things happen, whatever that is. And as we know, that support's different for each person. So now we also want a system where the people who provide services, the professionals that provide services um, across the service system are empowered to make a difference they're empowered to use public resources wisely, and they also get the support that they need to make those two things happen in partnership with the people that they're supporting. So said another way, we just simply want a system where everybody gets to feel heard and has an opportunity to contribute and where change really is possible, where we know and can work towards change for people, for organizations, as well as for, um, for our systems. So this brings us to some ideas um, in, a, in an article for the framework, excuse me, the framework for accomplishment by John O'Brien and Connie O'Brien. And John and Connie said that we, had, we have as a human services system three fundamental purposes for existing as a human services system. The first is to help people discover and move toward a desirable future. The second is to help people that we support in ways that give them access to more valued experiences or ways that help them to maintain their access to what they called valued experiences and we'll talk more about that in a minute. And then also part of our role as human service providers is to strengthen the community, to strengthen community competence and the community's ability to welcome people. So if we really look at the work we do, because we are it's also critically important that we keep people healthy and safe. We often veer away from thinking in the terms that John and Connie are encouraging us to think from. We often neglect to think about how do we help people to have these valued experiences. So what are those, those five valued experiences? The first is personal relationships, relationships that matter, and uh, people being able to choose, discover those relationships, expand and grow those relationships. The second is that people, um, people value being able to share places and activities. Um, things like just sharing a cup of coffee with colleagues in the morning. Um, ordinary, everyday experiences like the lunchroom, like happy hour after work, any of those kinds of experiences that we share with other human beings, access to those experiences. Um, the third value is um, valued experiences, the opportunity to contribute. We all want to contribute to others as well as be contributed to. The fourth is making choices, um, simple choices, complex choices, and the choices that matter to us as individuals are different. Um, what is a choice that really makes a difference for me to make? Um, someone else might, that might not be that important to them. So knowing what choices really matter to people and giving them opportunities to make choices in life um, is the fourth valued experience. And then the fifth is being treated, so simply put, but probably the most important, which is being treated with respect and having a valued social role. And when we look at social roles, there are, there are an endless list of them we can look at. So for myself, um, certainly my role uh, as a professional, as a trainer, is a valued social role. Um, who I am as a mom is a valued social role. Being a parent, being a colleague, um, for many of us, uh, our membership in a church community is a valued social role. Um, and ultimately, what we do for our work is a huge valued social role. It's often the first thing we ask someone when we meet them. What do you do? So it's, we want to think in terms of these social roles for all people, um, but especially for the people that we support where um, that may not be the framework we're thinking from. So while there's no comprehensive list of valued social roles, it is easy to recognize someone who does not have one. <laughs> so one of the things that's critical in this whole discussion, and especially uh, when thinking from uh, social roles, 
is our language. Um, the language we use, it literally defines who we are and often defines what's possible for us and for our future. So in our own lives, if you think for yourself, in your own life, you're always defining and redefining with your language the relationships that are important to you, the gifts and contributions that you have to contribute to others, as well as the roles that you have in life. You're constantly defining and redefining those. And we need to be cautious and thoughtful about the language we use in helping people to define and redefine the roles that they have in their lives. And I think as a parent, I've begun to learn and understand the power of my language as a professional in a way I didn't understand before I became a parent. The power that we have as professionals to um, help people to discover and define who they are is extraordinary. And it's something that person-centered thinking can help us to leverage and use with great caution. I love this quote, uh, a father who said that his dreams for his daughter were no different than the dreams he had for his other children. He hoped that someday she would be a friend, a wife, a mother, a colleague, a taxpayer, and he said anything but a client. And unfortunately, too often, the way that we talk about the people that we support is in terms of the service system or the services and supports that they need rather than who they are in their role and who they want to be um, as they move uh, towards their goals and their dreams in the future. So when we start to really think about language and our human services system, there, um, I, I like this diagram a lot. It talks about the contrasting realities we have in the system. So at the top, is what's uh, called the promise of perfection or our system-centered language. Um, and at the bottom, we look at what is, the, uh, what, is what we would term person-centered language. So if we look more closely at the top, our, our system-centered language includes things like procedures and policies. Um, we talk in the housing world about beds. We talk about slots. We talk about quotas. We talk about... Um, employment in, um, in ways that are not individualized. So we have all of this, this system that's built up and this language that's built up that has nothing to do with what people really want. It's required and it's important to the system, but it's ultimately not always important to the people we support and it's not always helpful to get them to where we wanna go. So we have all that required language that keeps our system going. And then at the bottom of this dia diagram, we have um, what, what's termed the art of imperfection and the system-centered language. And this includes things like people's dreams, what they wanna do with their life, how they wanna contribute to others. These are the things and the conversations that happen in living rooms. These are the experiences we have uh, with our friends, with our family. These are the things that grow naturally in our networks and our support systems. This is, the, um, this is kind of the language of life. And when we look at this diagram, we can see really clearly, no wonder there's tension because there's all these things we need to do to keep the system moving and to keep the, um, the system operating for people, and that's important. But what's also important is that we're looking at individuals' lives. And so it's, it is no wonder that there's tension, and that's where person-centered thinking and person-centered practices um, come in to be so critical so that we can have um, the language of person-centeredness and the language of life um, be something that helps us to drive our system. So when we look at valued experiences and person-centered thinking, um, these valued experiences are, or they help us to discover the things that are really important to people. And as we talk about person-centered thinking, that really is the, that's the core value and the core principle is um, that we need to have a good balance between what's important to and for people. And the things that are important to us are those things that give us satisfaction and fulfillment that give us real meaning in life or those valued experiences. 
it's really critical that we're building on strengths and focusing on what's important to people. This is how we get from where we are to where we want to be in life for any of us. Our goals should be based in what we value and what's important to us. And that helps us get to where we want to where we want to go. Um, that will ultimately help us find uh, the ways that we have to contribute to the community and to one another. But we need to be thinking from there. So as I said, all person-centered practices are grounded in and, um, and a key component of implementing person-centered practices is this idea of strengthening our community. And strengthening community competency requires that we're applying person-centered thinking skills everywhere with everyone. So people say it takes a village. It really is required that that whole village is thinking in person-centered ways and interacting in person-centered ways. So when it comes to employment, we need to both be honoring what the individual needs and wants, but also what does the employee, excuse me, what does the employer need and want? What is important to the employer? And how can we use our skills as professionals to match the individual's gifts and strengths and skills with the needs and, um, and gifts and strengths and roles that an employer has to, off has to offer? So how can we think about those things and find um, a match for people? And person-centered thinking provides a lot of different skills so that we can discover those matches. So for a very long time, we've talked about person-centered planning. And often people ask me, what's the difference between person-centered thinking and person-centered planning? And there is a, a key difference. Person-centered planning really is focused on events. It's focused on how do we get from where I am today to where I want to be. It is uh, f often a series of action planning. Um, uh, it really is focused on events, uh, getting from where we are today to where we want to be. Um, Person-centered thinking is about impacting where we are today. <laughs> Person-centered thinking provides a great foundation on which to build a person-centered plan, but it is ultimately about our everyday ways of thinking and interacting with one another and, um, and how we can make a difference for people now, not just necessarily in six months or in a year or where we want to get to in the future. How do we make a difference for people right now today? Person-centered thinking changes um, our everyday ways of thinking, and it impacts and creates a foundation for planning. And as we've talked about, it also does impact organizational change, and it impacts change for our systems. So as I said, person-centered planning focus on, focuses specifically on events and getting from where we are now to where we want to get to. We actually need both. So we need both in the system. We need to be thinking in person-centered ways to make a difference for people now, to create a good foundation. But we also need to be thinking about longer term goals and dreams and implementing action steps and plans towards those or doing also person-centered plans. Um, I like this slide because I think it's funny. Dr. King said, I have a dream. He did not say I have an annual plan, quarterly goals and objectives. So while quarterly goals and objectives are important, it's really, really critical that we're focused on what that dream is and what that individual wants and needs um, and what can we change and make a difference in today. So let's look a little bit more at person-centered thinking and this core concept of what's important to and for and what creates a good balance. And then I want to talk about one of the tools that I think is fundamental to this um, idea of building employment opportunities and real employment for the people that we're supporting. So important to, when we think about what's important to us, ultimately we're thinking about the people that are important, the activities that are important, the places that we go, those rituals and routines, um, those things that give us satisfaction, the things that give us fulfillment, that leave us feeling um, comforted, fulfilled, and content in life. These are obvious things, like some of us don't do real well if we don't have that cup of coffee in the morning. And they're things that are less obvious, like the pace of our morning, having a little bit of time when we arrive to work to get settled before having a lot of intense interactions with people. That's an example of something that may not be at the forefront of someone's mind, but may actually be the kind of thing that makes or breaks a day. So when we're thinking about creating a good balance for people and 
we need to understand what really gives them satisfaction and fulfillment and what leaves people content. And it's not so simple as making a list. These things really have to be discovered. Because while it's easy to say, I love to have a cup of coffee in the morning, it's much harder to identify and discover what are the paces and the routines of my workday that make my work a good fit for me? Or what are the paces and routines that I need that might require some accommodation or some conversation with an employer? When we look at, what, when we look at employment, employment is often a source of things that are important to us. It's a source of those things that give us satisfaction and fulfillment. So for many of us, um, we have a sense of status because of the jobs that we have or the contributions that we make in our work. Um, for many of us, the rituals and routines of our day are guided by the work that we have the opportunity to do, the colleagues we have an opportunity to relate to. Our work is an important source of what's important to us. And there's all sorts of things unique to us as individuals that also impact what's important to us that we want to bring into the workplace when we're looking at creating a good match. Now the, the flip side in creating a balance with what's important to us is this idea of what's important for us. And as a system, we've gotten quite good at managing what's important for people. These are the areas of health and safety. How can we keep, keep people healthy and safe? But also, what can we provide to provide opportunities for folks to be valued and contributing members of their community? Or said another way, how do we provide opportunities for people to um, identify and grow in social roles that are important to them? So we talk in person-centered thinking when we're thinking in person-centered ways. We're not just thinking about what's important to people or what's important for people. We're really thinking about what creates a good balance for people. And there's a few things about this um, that are interesting and that make finding that balance a little bit complex. So the first is that really none of us do anything that's important for us unless there's some element of what's also important to us that's involved. So classic example is um, many people have struggled over many years to quit smoking. And we all know smoking isn't good for us. And yet that's often not enough to have someone manage putting down cigarettes forever. So what it is when, when we look and when we ask people, well, what had you successfully quit smoking? Oftentimes the answers people give are things like, my children, my spouse, it got too expensive. <laughs> the examples we get are those things that are important to us, ultimately started to have so much weight that we gave up something that wasn't good for us. So said another way, there's a hook. What's important to us provides a hook so that we are responsible for and manage those things we need to manage for being healthy and safe and well. This is true in all areas of life. So when we look at employment, it may be important for us to dress a certain way or groom in a certain way or have a particular set of skills for a job. Um, managing and being responsible for that is much, much easier when we're driven by, and this is true for any of us, it's easier when we're driven by what's important for us, the relationships that matter, the things that leave us happy, the things that make us fulfilled in life. So understanding this balance is critical. And where we start in finding a good fit for people, where we need to start is by understanding what matters to them, what they value, what's important to them. And when we understand that, finding a balance will come naturally. The sequence matters. We first must understand what's important to people before we can start to um, explore what's important for them and also ultimately find a good match for them um, in the realm of employment. So when we look at this balance of important to and for, there's a few uh, risks that we can uh, find, there's a few pitfalls we can find ourselves falling into. Um, one is focusing too much on what's important for someone, um, focusing too much on health and safety, um, 
frankly, uh, as a parent, I can see that sometimes I get a little obsessed with my son being healthy and safe to the expense of him having choices. And when that happens, when my balance flips too heavily in the direction of what's important for him, I'm dictating his lifestyle. And we never want to do that for people. We want to um, we want to open up opportunities and choices, not close them down. So too much focus on what's important for um, leads to dictating lifestyle. On the flip side, too much focus on what's important to someone um, is a world we might define as all choice and no responsibility. And that world is risky. That world can be dangerous. Um, it, it could be a happy world where we're doing a lot of what we want, but uh, at the expense of our health and safety or at the expense of balance. So we certainly don't want that either. Person-centered thinking is about um, understanding what's important to people, also understanding what they need and what's important for them, and helping us discover what creates a good balance for that individual. So when we think about raising our expectations for what's possible, when we think about what's possible for people in uh, contributing to their communities and um, uh, being great employees, we need to be thinking in new ways, not just about the people we support, but we need to be thinking in new ways about our colleagues, about our system. We need to be thinking in new ways about employers, about potential employers. It does take a village, and person-centered practices apply to everyone in the village. We need to be thinking what makes a good balance, not just for the people we support, but for uh, the employers and for the community as well. So as we move forward and look to raise our expectations of the people um, that we provide services to, we need to recognize that this can be a difficult challenge because it is thinking in new ways. It is a process of discovery. There are not black and white answers. So many of the people that I've supported over the years have been supported in a system of services and, and, and supports that have lowered expectations or provide limited opportunities to learn and make choices. What happens in those situations is people stop dreaming and it becomes critical that we go into an open process of discovering alongside people what gifts they have, what contributions they want to make, what they need to learn to make those contributions and to share those gifts. That's where person-centered facilitators and um, navigators, if you will, can be really helpful in the process because they can help us to see people in new ways. And we can use person-centered thinking skills to see outside of the box we may find ourselves in. It's also important to recognize that employers need to see value, and that ultimately is the essence of all employee, employment work, is that we're responding to the needs and the challenges that employers have, and we're providing solutions to those needs and challenges. So the dilemma for someone with a developmental or other disability is that employers need to see, they may need to see how their needs will be met when hiring someone with a disability. They may need some help to bridge how those needs and visualize how those needs will be met. So the dilemma and the challenge is that we need to be going into employment situations, job interviews, um, prepared to show an employer how their needs will be met while not putting disability first, but putting the strengths of the individual first. So we need to also create a balance there. How do we address what the employer is going to need and how we can provide it without ignoring what the disability may also require? So there's this careful balance here um, in responding to an employer's needs. And a lot of it is about how we talk about one another and the language that we use. So in employment and in any, anywhere in our service system really, we are beginning to think from and operate from a strengths-based focus where we have an awareness of what the hopes and dreams of an individual are. We have a respect for what's important to them and we start to create a good match in the world of employment um, 
that honors what's important to people, that contributes those strengths. We do not know what the upper limits of anyone's potential is. We don't know, and that is not our job to define. And unfortunately, our system's language too often does limit what's possible for people. So being careful and thoughtful about the words we use, the way that we describe people, I think is at the heart of everything that we do. In order to really generate options for people, existing options or new options requires that we are using language differently, requires that we're going on the hunt and exploring for strengths and gifts in ways that we haven't always done. I recently was talking to someone, we have um, been doing some uh, organizational person-centered work with, and they were really struggling with a person they supported to find a community-based job. They knew that he had some very unique gifts. He also had some very unique challenges, um, had to set his own pace for his work day. Um, there were a lot of challenges the person presented, but he loved food loved to feed other people, and that was something he really wanted to contribute. And in looking at how do we make a difference now, rather than a very long-term goal and plan, they created a business for him to, to uh, do like a healthy food basket in his current workplace. So while he is served in a, a, a DT&H setting, and they don't yet have him in a community-based uh, job, they did discover a very unique gift that he wanted to contribute and built a business around that. And now are looking at how do we now grow that business in outside of the walls where it is now and how can what he's learned to contribute in that business um, continue to be explored and expanded um, and grow in the community. So person-centered thinking, again, is not about some uh, lofty long-term goal. It's how can we make a difference now and then how can we continue to build that into long, longer-term goals? Because ultimately that's what life is for all of us. <laughs> There's How do we make today the best day we can make it and how do we continue to grow our careers and our lives in the directions that we want them to go, contributing the gifts and talents that we want to contribute to others. So where do we really start? Again, I, I think it's the most important thing is that we start um, every time we open our mouth, that we are careful about the words that we use. And there's a couple ways that I want to think about this um, as we uh, close uh, this webinar. So the first is to think about positive introductions. So how do we introduce people putting their strengths forward, putting their gifts and contributions forward? It's a little thing, but it's often something that our paperwork and our system doesn't necessarily pull for because we have paperwork that asks for a person's name followed by their diagnosis often. And we start to learn to think about um, accommodations uh, first and then think about gifts. And I encourage you to flip that around and really think about gifts first and introduce people the way that you would introduce your neighbor or your friend with your gifts or the individual's gifts first. Um, a really simple exercise can be um, getting a team of people together and simply asking, what do you like and admire about the person? I think if we started every meeting that we had to support someone, if every meeting that we had started with everyone around the table sharing one thing they liked and admired about someone, it would change the context of that meeting and it would change the context of how we provide services. It's a simple, small thing, but how we introduce people, there is only one chance to make a first impression. It's critical. It's critical. Now, there's the flip side of like and admire, which is that most of us have some negative reputations that may follow us around, some of those things that are um, our least proud characteristics or traits. So how do we deal with that with the people that we support? There's actually a three-step process to addressing negative reputations that I'd like you to consider and think about. It's something we talk about in the person-centered thinking uh, class. And the first is, the first step is to think about 
we think about that negative reputation, is there anything that's actually positive about that negative reputation? The second step is, what does that teach us about what is important to the person or what the person really values? And the third step is, um, how can we best support the person where that negative trait really is a negative trait? So if we look, for example, um, I'll, I'll use myself, um, since I'm the only one here. Um, <laughs> my, um, what, one of the things that many people who work closely with me know is that I'm exceptionally picky. I'm very, very picky about how things are done, particularly around our training. So I do a lot of person-centered thinking and planning training, and there's a particular way I like things done. So one of my negative reputations could be that I'm picky. But if we look at that and look at this first step, what are the actual positive characteristics of someone that we might call picky? Um, we might also call that person detail-oriented. And I, for one, would rather be introduced as someone who's detail-oriented than as <laughs> someone who's very picky to work with. Um, so it's, it's, it's actually true about me that I'm detail-oriented. And it's a, certainly a much nicer foot to put forward. Um, so how can we think about those negative reputations people have? How can we think about them and also have that help us to recognize the positive things that they bring to the table? So the second step is what is important to the person. So if we look at my example, I'm yes, I am picky, but I'm also known to be really detail-oriented. And what does that say about who I am and what's important to me, what I value? One thing I really value is that the trainings that we provide across the state are of co high quality and that whatever trainer you have um, is able to teach and communicate the skills of person-centered thinking in a really effective way. So I'm someone who's detail-oriented and uh, for whom quality is really important. And then there are all sorts of ways you can support me if I'm getting bogged down in my pickiness, if I'm worrying too much about how things go. Um, and there's a whole team of people that I work with, and we have conversations about how we can support each other. So it's much more useful to look at someone like me, who we could call picky, and look at me as a contributor to um, detail and to quality. If we are careful and think carefully about how we describe people, the opportunities open up. The expectations we have can be expanded because what we're focusing on is their gifts and strengths. And yes, we will address what people need. And yes, we need to address the support that people need. But we also need to honor and respect and highlight and build those positive things. And if you get nothing out of this webinar but to spend more time focusing on gifts, then it was worth our time. It's the most important thing we can do is manage how we speak about people and highlight their gifts and talents. Um, and when it comes to those things that we need, support around will provide that, but let's not have that be how we introduce people. So that's one example of a skill that we teach to help people to think in more person-centered ways. There's a two-day training that outlines 12 different skills that you can use to discover what really matters to people and discover their gifts and talents and opportunities for them. If you're interested in that training, um, there's a link on the screen now um, to the website where you could register to learn more about those different skills um, that can help you in this journey of being person-centered and providing opportunities for people. A few other thoughts um, about career planning specifically. What individuals need, um, there's a list here of, of very specific things that individuals need in exploring employment. And they're things like uh, career-focused assessments, um, opportunities to actually be exposed to careers, opportunities to practice the skills that people need in different jobs. These are critically important as we plan for the future. On-the-job training opportunities is how all of us learn. Um, 
none of us learn in a vacuum. We learn on the job. <laughs> and there's a note at the, uh, the top of the screen, that screen that says, as early as possible, providing these things. My son's eight years old, and I'm already thinking forward to what are the skills and interests he has that we can tap and grow and expand that will be of value to a future employer. So we need to be thinking about these things as early as we can. And they are, many of them are the same things that any of us would need. We need experiences. We need the opportunity to focus on our strengths to build those experiences. We need to create goals that are consistent with and that provide us opportunities to be connected to what's really important to us, to what we value, to what makes us happy. And we need to have opportunities to contribute those things and those gifts to employers. It's really a matter of making those connections. And we can get there. And we'll get there by raising our expectations. And we'll get there by using language that highlights gifts and talents rather than focuses and handicaps people based on their disability.